All right. Um, so everybody, we are back again, and I'm very excited because Julia is going to be our co-instructor for this. Yeah. And she's an absolute pro. This is like what what you do for a living. For sure, yes. It's yeah. Sure. Um, <laughs> I'm just doing the make em ups every time. <laughs> But here we are. You know what? Most of the song. Yeah, it works out. So uh, tonight we're going to talk about composite material. And Julia, please feel free to talk as much as you possibly want. Okay, and, but and I'm then... going to keep this meeting so that we don't end up in a. Yeah. yeah. I like it. I like it. Um, and so we're going to go through just some of these big ideas, and we have some stuff physically in the room. And then I think it's easy to say that this week, sometime. We're going to do meetups where we come and do this together all in one place in one time because it's big and wet and messy and it's good to just make that mess twice. <laughs> so at least. Well, yeah, at least at least twice. OK, so. Um, let's see here. We're going to talk about some theory, some examples, some and then some of the like specifics of how you do these and then like how you actually get going with it. That's the plan. Um, plan. Yeah. 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 So do you have what do you have any like theory revelations, big, big ideas, big thoughts about this? Uh, well, are you using just your mic? Yeah, the laptop yeah. microphone is working. So you just sort you of want to swap. Uh, no, it should. It'll pick okay, it, up. it should pick you up. Okay. Raise your voice a little. Okay. It should be fine. So we can hear you. Awesome. That's good. I mean, <laughs> you say that now. Um, so composite materials essentially is like combining two materials to make up for what each of them lacks is the sort of like really, really basic theory because some things do certain stuff very, very well and other things either very badly or not at all. But when combined with a friend, they can do everything really well. Usually this is tensile versus compressive strength that you're talking about in a, you know, from a usage perspective, but yep. um, that is kind of the whole concept behind it, unless you have. No, that's, that's great. There's tons of really like very common in our world applied versions of this, like airplanes are not made out of metal anymore. They're made out of composites because it's lighter and stronger. Um, you know what that is the airplane is made out of? Yeah, it's, it's like fabric and a resin, and they bake it in a giant autoclave. There's ovens that you can walk into. It's wild. But there's still some airplanes that are clearly made with metal. There's like all of it. There's old ones. And there's an ad campaign from one of the airlines that was Big Metal Bird, was what they played on the video screen. And I knew the plane I was sitting in was not made of metal. <laughs> Fair. Yeah. So it's it's just funny. Um, but that's basically it. Like, Singular materials are nice, but it's pretty rare in a modern world to just have one material that you use for an entire thing. Um, like injection molded plastic lawn furniture is about it. <laughs> um, but even that, the plastic probably has additives. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's true. Here's even like, if you want to get super nerdy, there's material science and like, these are all graphs of material properties like a brittle material, strong metals usually follow this ductile curve where they like, they stretch and then they they deform and then they snap. Plastic things are just floppy. Mm -hmm. Here's different types of wood, which is crazy and like different strength and service temperatures. That's kind of wild to see if you really wanted to dig into a cool graph. Um, and like, I've built a lot of little tiny bridges and planes with kids out of balsa wood. Uh, you're not sharing. Oh, oh, I'm not sharing. What? Do, 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 do. Okay, hold on. Stop share. Try sharing again. Oh boy. Screen one. That's the screen. Hit share. Is it working now? Screen sharing is no. loading. It says I am screen sharing. Well, you are yes. but you're screen sharing. Oh, I'm screen sharing the wrong screen. I am. That's yeah, that's my that okay. Hold on one moment, please. I can zoom, I promise. Screen this we're just that gonna one. do just that one. We're gonna share a browser tab. There we go. Great, okay. All right. Yeah. So sorry about that. 
Yep. <laughs> this is, uh, so the curves over here on the top right, on the right side, those are curves that are all related to material properties. And so there's all sorts of interesting things to consider. Like both, like I was saying, balsa wood, it will crumble in your hand without any strap, without any real effort. But if you could hang from a stick of balsa wood, you can probably hold my weight. Like they're really good at tension, but they're really garbage at compression or cross forces. So that's it's exactly what Julia was saying. Um, and then it's fun to have mashups of materials. So these are just some, there are some things that do get better. I appreciate it. When you mix them up. Uh, others are probably bad choices. Well, that's an owl face. <laughs> yeah, it's an owl on <laughs> spider. Yeah. There's a, a lot of strange things going on. But um, in general, you mix things up and you get the best of both worlds. This is a lot of examples of these things. I, When you look at a bridge, there's a lot of stuff going on in a bridge. Like you have all that metal structure on top. Metal's very good at stretching and not having a problem, whereas concrete's really, really bad at that. Concrete and asphalt are really only good when you squish them and push on them. And so you have this dynamic that you have to think about. Um, so the steel top of that bridge on the left is so that when your car drives across it and the whole thing stretches, it's gonna be fine. Um, and the Q bridge has those big tension cables so that all of the pulling forces go onto the tension cables and the vertical pylons are holding up the weight of all the bridge. So it's basically, because it's a balanced set of cables on either side, basically all of the weight of the bridge is being compressed down through those vertical columns, which is fascinating if you want to nerd out on it. Um, and the, there's a notable exception of the like classic arch. Everything in that is in compression. And so you can build a bridge like that where the entire thing is supported only with compressive forces, and then it works out fine. It's why the architecture I was say that way, like Rome. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it really is. Um, because you didn't need to have complicated multi-material things. Mm -hmm. And it and it still works perfectly fine. I would say I'm I'm a professional sculptor, and that is where the mold making aspect comes in that I do uh, as part of my job. So this is sort of the I'm pointing at the bridge. <laughs> um the, the concept of transferring force is very much wrapped up into the making of physical objects, especially when you're you're talking about molding and casting. And that's from the, you know, the final product all the way back down through the mold itself, because everything has to hold its shape in some way or another. So the concept just transfers across everything, not just the material. Yeah. And if I were to try and convey it to a high schooler in the simplest way possible. Only think about two forces. Is it squishing? Is it in compression? Or is it being pulled on? Is it in tension? And if you just start to think about the dynamic of those two, you can think a little bit more about how it all fits, how it all fits together. Oh. Um, there's a, a million good examples of composites in the world. Plywood is everybody's favorite. Hello. Uh, Plywood is a lot stronger than if you had the exact same type of wood, the exact same amount of wood, and it was all the same straight grain. If you, when you take plywood, if you've ever sanded through it, you'll notice that each layer is oriented 90 degrees to each other. And that's because the, the fibers are then opposed and it'll hold its weight and deflect a lot less. It's much, much stronger than if it were just single piece of wood at three quarters of an inch thick. Um, this like, Honeycomb structure, if you've ever busted an Ikea table, they use that stuff inside with a, a thin hardboard layer on top and bottom and then that MDF. Most materials, it turns out the strain and stress of bending happens right at the top and bottom surface. The inside is just sort of fluff. It's how Ikea can make those tables so lightweight. It's how these tables are so lightweight. If you look at the ends of them, there's a, there's a one by two around the edges and then the top and bottom is just a thin veneer. If you look at the side of the table, that's right in front of you. Inside, they're definitely hollow, like knock on the door. It's 100% hollow inside. Uh, the, that is totally a thing that you do. Sometimes you do unidirectional fibers, bidirectional, woven, or discontinuous fiber. 
this is like in con in modern concretes to add fibers like this. Have you ever done that to concrete before? Um, maybe I have definitely done it to plaster. I have certainly done it to resin. Okay, cool. I've done. I did a concrete countertop and did the little discontinuous fibers. Um, yeah, filler materials can have different benefits and. Keeping it from snapping in half is a big one. That's a that's a big benefit for sure. Um, and there's lots of different ways that this works, but these are all all worth considering when you're thinking about stuff. And we've we've definitely all interacted with, probably purchased these things before and not paid it a second mind. So, some examples, some specific examples of composite materials in your everyday life. Concrete and rebar is the one that's everywhere, all the time, everywhere. The rebar is really good at stretching and keeps the concrete from cracking when it would be in tension. And the concrete itself is at good at compression, so it's good at being pushed on and having things weighing on it. Um, do you want to explain any of these? Okay. I mean, you got it. Okay, all right. Yeah, how about cast? I feel like that's you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that exact same uh, concept is just using uh, the good old plaster, which is a really amazing material. Gypsums uh, can do so much. They crack. You can easily crack it. The, ad the addition of just a little bit of burlap or cloth or something makes them wildly stronger, like ridiculously different. Um, and I actually use those for mold shells. And then they're here used for people's shells. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that works. Um, other places where it pops up, plywood we talked about, carbon fiber, we have examples in the room, lots of high-end cars and things look like that. Yeah, we can pass them around. Um, and we have like carbon fiber, the fabric also, which is just like a fun floppy fabric. And so you fill it with resin and then it's not. So carbon fiber is just, it's just a cloth. Like it's not even like a good cloth. It's here's phrase instantly on the edge. Yeah, the phrase before you look at it. It's so weird, right? I feel like I've seen like bags made out of something yeah. similar. Yeah. Yeah. It's a strange material. That white looking one is made out of tool, like the most useless non structural fabric around. And it's just coated with resin, and there it turns into that. Um, drywall is another one that's a good one. Drywall is a fire safe wall coating material. So you've got, it's just paper on the two sides of the drywall. And then in fiber is made out of wood. Yeah. And, and then the inside is um, all gypsum. gypsum. So it's just gypsum and paper and that's it. And it works great. It's nice and cheap. Relatively, it's fairly light. It works well for construction. It's pretty modular. It's easy to work with and cut. And you can, in theory, get smooth walls. In theory. In theory. Yeah. <laughs> um, as long as you know, you know when to not touch it. Right. 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 Um, flooring, solid floor, and engineered floors can look the same on top, but solid wood will warp and bend if you remember from the wood shop. Whereas engineered wood with the plywood bottom is going to stay much flatter. And so that is a real benefit. The downside is you can't keep sanding it to refinish the top surface if you live in a house long enough to refinish your floors. And I don't think most of us do in any or one you house. Buy a house or you, that needs its floors refinished. That's probably I feel like that's more. That's probably more realistic. Yeah. And so you you only have this little height that you can refinish through versus a solid floor, you can really go for it. Here's the big oven for airplanes. Yeah which is pretty wild that you just put the airplane body in there and then it's, it holds it all out. And then it, how nervous that guy is. Yeah. He's real terrified. There's a giant door that would swing shut and close him in. I, I think I'd be afraid also, what do we do? but this, like, I love this retro poster for cars. It was like, it was the easiest way to get a sports car is take everything we have about our all metal cars and just build their bodies out of fiberglass. And you lose so much weight that now they're performance vehicles. And that was, that was it. That was the start of it. So let's go through some actual procedures for these. Boats. Wet layups, all sorts of boat things. Um, so this is 
making a canoe, which is not a goal for this week. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> but boat bodies, RVs, cars, all that sort of stuff that can all be fixed with just fiberglass and some epoxy right over the top. You can just go for it with that and then sand it flat if that's your jam. The term would be laminating. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, when you're looking at different products, sure. Laminating epoxies are for making thin layers, which are different formulas from casting epoxies for resins. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Also, it looks to me like this is a boat that has a coating of resin and probably fiberglass fabric. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Look how like the, the fabric is white, but then once it's it's soaked with resin, it becomes kind of transparent. Yep. And you can see right through it. You wouldn't really necessarily know that there's anything there, which is a pretty cool effect. They my inner physics teacher really wants to say out loud they have the same index of refraction. The epoxy and the fiberglass so it just disappears interesting yeah um and so you really can't see it. it's just clear, a clear coating layer on top of the wood but ultimately the wood is more like the decorative substructure of that boat ultimately it's, it gives it the shape like it's really a fiberglass boat and the wood is there to look nice um same for cars if you're doing concrete and rebar it's also sort of a weird open wet layup where it's just there the two parts are mixed together and then it's put in wet and then you let it you let it dry it's used everywhere all over the place in construction because it's so workable um and ultimately it's dirt that you get wet and that's about it um interestingly and this is in case you're curious concrete does not dry it sets it cures yeah it cures it, there's an internal chemical reaction that happens and it heats up and it it does chemical reaction -y things inside there. It requires water. It does require water, but but too much water is a problem. Almost everybody, almost everybody mixes concrete with too much water in it. Follow the instructions on the bag. If you add extra water, it gets soupier. However, that soupiness will make it less strong. If you want soupy concrete, you can buy a powder called plasticizer. And it's, I cannot express to you enough how it's magic pixie dust, like a, a thimble full. And all of a sudden a giant bucket, of, a wheelbarrow of concrete will go from like peanut butter grossness to soup. It's incredible how much it, the plasticizer stuff, you buy one bag and you'll have enough for a lifetime. And it really, really works. Is there a reason why you want soupy concrete? If you really so want to fit concrete. a mold. Well, yeah, it'll gel out flat kind of like you want the, the consistency of the viscosity, how soupy something is, will determine how much it is affected by gravity. And sometimes you want it to be, and sometimes you don't. So if you're looking to like pour a flat step in front of your house or something, you really want it to kind of level out on its own as much as possible. Yep. Because then you don't get gaps and weird things and it's flat. And... So there's a whole bunch of like front steps made of concrete that are actually poured upside down, mm -hmm. right? You know, where there's like three steps up and they have a handrail and they feel very standardized. Mm -hmm. Those are all made upside down. And then, and then they're yes. flip them over and the upside down, yeah. put them in the front of the house. And it takes a while to come to full strength, but it like, like a week. Yeah. I mean, well, but you look at like really huge structures, like the Hoover Dam, to how long? It's still drying. It's still, yeah. It's still technically like in the process. Yeah. It's like, Hundred. It's unbelievably yeah. thick across the bottom. Dams are skinny at the top, but they get wider as you go down. Um, and so in the bottom, like huge section, it's still it's still drying. Um, so let's say you have a wet layup, but open to the environment just isn't your jam. You may want to do some vacuum bagging. And this is what we hope to do a couple times this week. We actually have some of the things here in the photos with us. So this is a way that you can take something that's epoxy and a fabric and press them together. And you press them together using air pressure. We often forget that we're in, I, I don't know, I often forget that I'm in an ocean of air. We are like little crabs crawling around on the bottom of a weird, airy ocean. Um, and so you can use that if you put them in a, in a bag like this that we can make together out of a few materials. You can use the air pressure to compress things together. And so here's the example 
This is the actual composite we'll pass around. I was. I've touched it many times. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll go that way. Um, well, this composite is made out of two dress shirts. And I was trying to make a, a catch basin for the robot bartender. It didn't work out, but it's got different zones with different amounts of layers. And if you try and flex them where it says one or two or four layers, um, you can feel the difference in how sturdy it is. And so it doesn't take a lot of layers to really get the benefit of multiple materials. Um, I would add at this point that vacuum is a great tool in mold making and casting because the goal of most composites is to get the air out of the mix because you want everything to be like made it right up against itself. You want the resin and the layers or, or you know, whatever your, your liquid component is um, to be that you, you want like no interference in between because that, that's what gives us the strength. Whenever there's a gap, like imagine if your plywood had an air gap in between each layer, it would then become like cardboard. It is not the same at all. It's the fact that they're made it really strongly that makes the strength happen. And the vacuum serves a couple of purposes in the bag. First of all, like the bag is like actively pressing. So it's, it's physically squishing everything together. But also as the air is removed, the resin has no choice but to fill the gaps in between the fibers, which causes that like great strengthening. Um, and it's very difficult to get that effect in certain respects or in certain um, techniques with certain materials unless you use vacuum or pressure. So it's a really cool thing that we can do in a lot of uh, materials kind of rely on this to be able to work properly. So. Yeah. And it, we have all the stuff like here in the room. We're going to show you what those look like. It's the next slide. It's like actually kind of low tech, which is cool. Yeah. It's a, it's like really, you know, for a couple hundred bucks, we bought all the kit that it takes to make it happen. Um, it's like a big old plastic bag. <laughs> it is that, yeah, that's all it is. But like, if you look at this diagram, there's a, a whole bunch of different specific layers. They're all, they're all right here. If I'm going to be on camera, there's so you start off with this bagging film, which is this stuff, and it inside it. So it's got a plastic cover, but inside that plastic cover, it's just a plastic sheet that is different from using a garbage bag. I was tempted to use garbage bags when I first thought about getting a set of stuff. Made. Yeah, you kind of need it to not stretch. <laughs> or, well, that, yeah, stuff, not stretch. that can stretch to five times its size in any one spot. So when I mean stretch, I mean stretch with hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to get hair. Yeah. And then this one, one of these, one of the two, is a plastic sheet with a bunch of holes in it. So you saw, if you go back a slide, actually, see those sort of dots showing up on the left and the bottom? Those dots are from the bleeder. So there's little holes in the plastic. That might actually be the bleeder with little holes in the plastic. Yeah. <laughs> Is there holes in it? Yeah. Open it up a little. You can look inside. The... This is the one that's, I think this is the one that's, now that I'm saying this out loud. Yeah. You want it to conform, but never ever tear. Yeah, this like just stretches like crazy without a problem. And then eventually it'll tear, but it stretches really. <laughs> okay, better than your average leg had yeah. crash bag, you know, and like. Right. Versus that, if you open it up, you'll see there's little perforated holes throughout the whole thing. I'm trying to find the perforated holes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just keep digging it open and you'll, you'll get there eventually. And then this is another layer. This is essentially, this one is the one that's probably the least special of all of them, which is a little sad. It's just like a little felt. Okay. No, it's, it's, no, it's special too, but in its own way. Uh, it's just like a layer of uh, extra fluffy felt so that there's a spot for the resin to go. Mm. And so like in, in here, there's a series of layers. You have to make a very specific taco in order for this to all work out the right way where you've got your um, bleeder valve or bleeder layer is right up against the composite you're going to make. And then there's the fluffy felt layer. And then there's the, the bag that goes all around it. And then this like border stuff is a vacuum sealer that will let you make a bag that's airtight so that hopefully you can leave it under vacuum and it'll sort of sit there for double sticky. Yeah, double sticky tape that's like vacuum tolerant so that it'll work for a day or so of setting up. 
but super cute. Yeah. And then like a little seal, you poke a hole into the bag, and this is how you can add a vacuum pressure through the bagging material itself, is with this little deal. And so the like slightly blue part is the vacuum sealer, and then the, the part on top is from the hydraulics from a tractor. Yes. Because it works. It's fun. Yeah. I grew up on a farm, so I don't know. It's fitting. Like I just had tractor parts just laying around. Yeah. We did a description. What is okay? Um, but it's if you stare at this long enough, you have to have some sort of a mold and then a release film of some sort. And this can be a chemical release film, a composite. There's your actual composite, it's the yellow thing. Then you have the perforated film, then the bleeder, and then the bagging film. And it's all a whole bunch of layers. So you have to line up just right. This is it's what we want to do it together. Yes. So you don't have to figure it out based on this graphic. Yeah, this is the first example you'll see of that sort of the weird mold making thing that you, you have to be thinking upside down and backwards. Yeah. Because your finished surface is the most hidden part of your setup. Meaning the part that comes out that you see, you know, like the, the pretty thing is basically this, this contour, this surface right here. Uh, like yeah, the inside of this like bowl mold shape. Yeah, the that, most hidden part. That is the thing. That is your, your ultimate end product. Yeah. And yeah. It, it, everything else kind of is um, less good. I'm not going to say it doesn't matter. I'm going to say it's not point. Right. In this, I was trying to make a mountain and I did not think about that. I mean, the really good part of the mountain design is on the bottom where I didn't want it. I should have made the opposite. I should have made my mold the opposite of the mountain, like the inverse. Yeah. It's like a jello mold, you yeah. know, like you invert that thing and then suddenly the bottom is now the top. Yep. And exactly. Um, here's if you wanted to see this a little bit more clearly, here's I'm gonna definitely mute this and we're gonna skip past all the advertisement parts. Um, this is so if you wanted to watch this, it you can find worse ways to spend 13 minutes of your life. Mm -hmm. But this is someone figuring out how to make a really precise uh, carbon fiber part. Look at look at how good at this they are. <laughs> they know exactly what they're doing. So you do all this, and it, whoa, oh oh boy. And as they as they go through, they've got this mold that they're gonna make things for, and they're making bike parts, I think, in this video. But they're they have a very very smooth mold, um, and that's going to be the exterior of the part, like Julie was just saying putting a layer of glossy resin right on the surface that everything else is going to back up. That means that you're going to have this cool, perfect film evenly across the surface. But that's the first thing that has to go in because you don't get a chance to go back after you've had everything else. You know, it's just sort of is what it is. Right. It's the green part, the like anti-sticky. That's silicone, probably. It's, it's, yeah, but that's just mold for sure. Yeah, it's the mold. To adhere perfectly to the it probably the doesn't it's probably just laying in there he's definitely going to vacuum it later um, i tried to find a vacuum at some some point it's probably years ago now i tried to find a video of the vacuum process and this is the best i found um because there's you really it's really really hard to wrap your head around until you see it and do it um which is different than other things where we've tried to to do it different ways but watching it happen can be really helpful to understand what's going on. And so you can tell this is a, sort of like not a um, not a quick process necessarily. And so you need to choose your materials so that they give you enough time to work. And right. also fibers people, like the bias, you know, being able to work around forms with your fabric. If it will only bend one way or another, then you end up with wrinkly problems later and that's like yet another thing but it's very much like clothing and that you have to account for changes in dimension and curvature and things like that like in the pattern itself yeah like you can't just put on like a shirt that's just two pieces of fabric and expect it to fit you you know yeah it it's an interesting and complicated process like all the folds and darts and all that you have to think about here and then here's a backer the guy's putting on. So this is like you can watch this whole process. Now he's actually vacuum bagging it. Um, so there's a series of like 
layers. I don't know what is going on. This must be, we must have clicked on after. Um, but in here, if you watch this process, you can see the pink is the like the bag that's going on. Well, it looks like that's the perforation and that's the, the bleeder layer. And then he's going to probably use the pink bag for laying it up. And then at some, it's here we go. Here's the quick release coupling. You do that and then you vacuum it and it sucks all the air out. Just that's the magic moment I want to make sure we saw. It's like when I put away all my blankets. For the... It's exactly that. For, and for precisely the same reason. The air just squishes it all in and makes it so that it works out just fine. But it's really like, it's kind of amazing how it works. You can see the extra resin bleeding through those, the, the bleeder filling up the, the felt. And that's what you want. And you actually kind of want even coverage. In a perfect world, you have little perfect dots everywhere. Yeah. Like nothing. if you just, theoretically speaking, like if you just dump your resin in there, maybe it'll coat everything. Probably it won't. You'll have gaps where they where it just didn't get. That's why you did that first paint on layer. Yeah. Um, but in general, when you're doing this and you want to think about things, you really want to consider what's the fabric you're going to use? What's the epoxy you're going to use? Are you going to make it a bowl? Do you want to eat cereal out of it? Then it needs to all be food safe. Um, and that's a thing. And then the, Julie was talking about the pot time and the cure time, like how we haven't talked about resin much, and we're going to talk about it more over the next several weeks, but it has a time, a timer to the chemical. Do you want to explain? Yeah, I mean, there, there are many kinds of resins and they have lots of, lots of different applications. Um, and we're going to kind of hit up against a lot of terminology that is very confusing if you don't know what it means because people frequently use things interchangeably when they sort of can't. So I'll say first off, like epoxies are resins, but not all resins are epoxies. Like an epoxy is made up of certain types of compounds and it, there are also urethane resins and polyester resins and lots of stuff. So a resin is basically a multi-component goo that you put together and it will cause a chemical reaction that will eventually cause it to harden. There is actually, I guess, a non-multi-component goo that you may have all seen, which is amber. That is a natural one where over time it becomes hard, but it starts out as a goo and then it hardens. So um, it does occur naturally, but boy, is it unnatural at these points. It's usually petroleum-based, then there are bioresins. Um, so each one is formulated to stay liquid for a certain amount of time and to cure at a certain profile. Some of them go very, very evenly, like epoxies cure very, very evenly, kind of on just a, a ramp where it'll be like a little bit over the course of hours in a very steady progression. And then some like urethanes will be liquid, 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 solid, you know, within a course of minutes or so. And um, both of those things have wonderful applications where they're needed and can be really annoying if you use them in a situation where they're not. So um, in vacuum bagging, you need something that stays liquid long enough for the entire process to work and then hardens. And that's why we use epoxy because it's great for that. It's also very strong. Yeah. 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 And not that stinky. Right. Epoxy is a good one for us. We have the one that we use when we work together as a group probably has an hour pot life. And so that means that you have an hour until like you need to be done. Yeah. It won't be solid in an hour, but that but you need to be done playing with it in yeah. an hour. And the pot life, there's usually different. Um, stages of the cure the first time is pot life where it's actively flowing and then there will be like a tacky cure for some where it's this is the stage where if you're going to put another layer on it's safe to do so it's not fully cured but it's not going to move around um and then there's you know full cure where it's totally set and you won't mess it up when you demold it or change it or anything like that so yeah, yeah. so as a general purview since we're going to do this vacuum bagging thing together this week We'll mix the epoxy and then you have an hour until we have to be done with what we're doing. And then we'll have 24 hours of cure time before we can come back and like open the mold and, and take out the things that we made. What's up, Kari? Two questions. Yeah. One, the peel ply, uh, is that like a silicone as well? Yeah, it's a, it's a, oh. it's the bleeder plastic. It's the perforated release film is what we have. 
So, so that's what the, is it made out of that doesn't stick to it. Um, Teflon. Is it Teflon? Or it's it's like a Teflon based plastic. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. And then are there resins that we cannot use in the space like that have polyester? Polyester, a a Dixie cup worth of polyester will smoke out the entire space all the way to the storage room. Like I cannot express to you wow. how much it reeks and how quickly. So you cannot that casting craft resin that is so frequently appearing is a very disgusting example of that stuff. I hate it. It's awful. <laughs> How do you really feel? I've used UV resins in the past. They've smelled, like, some have smelled really strongly and some haven't. Are those poly? So or... it, it is likely, you know, it's like without knowing what it is, they're, they're, they give, they, they off gas more. Mm -hmm. Epoxies and urethanes tend to do so less with the caveat that whenever you're dealing with, uh, and we'll get into this more in the casting, urethanes specifically have a very high exotherm because they tend to cure quicker. When that happens, there's heat and there's a chemical reaction and that just kind of tends to create more of a smell and more fumes. It's always good to figure out your ventilation ahead of time when you're doing stuff like this. One more question. Yeah, yeah, yeah please. Um, is there like a list on the Make Haven website of acceptable resins to use that aren't? I think right now it basically says don't use polyester. And if you have questions, you can always run it by us because truthfully, it's not one of the more utilized materials that we have. And the standard ones we've got are okay. If you have questions, just fire it at me and I will figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> There's also a fair amount of chemistry terms that we've been using. I, my like high school chemistry teacher brain mm -hmm. has been realizing. So like one of the things is exotherm, some chemical reactions. These are all chemical reactions that give off heat as they go. And that means that therms exit, heat exits the reaction. And so some of these get hot as they go. Concrete is a good example. Plaster, if you want to make a mold of your hand, don't stick your hand in a bucket of plaster because it gets hot. It will cook your hand. Also, you will be entombed within it. It is completely inflexible and you cannot remove your arm and we will have to call the fire department and ship you out. Yep. On yeah. The, on the way to the ER. Don't yeah. do that. Don't do that. Just don't do that. Um, there's, <laughs> but, like those. yeah, other reactions don't give off heat. And, and then there's a fun, weird class that we will not interact with these this month. There are endotherms that actually suck in heat from the environment and they get cold, which is kind of fun. Have you ever had one of those like hot cold packs or icy hot? It does some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it is. Yeah. And so in here, and you're talking about reaction rates, that's a whole, the, the juniors at the high school, they would love and hate this conversation all at once. So. Um, Generally, the faster it cures, the hotter it's going to get. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And you can, t if it starts to, if the bucket of goo starts to get warm, it's probably going to start setting now. And don't use styrofoam. Yeah. It will literally melt your container if you use the wrong container. So. Um, oh, like don't use a styrofoam. Oh, yeah, it'll go right through it. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, don't use styrofoam for anything yeah, ever, but in yeah. this case. Yep. Yeah. All right. And then, okay, so let's say you have these vacuum bagging. Seems cool. It's also a fair amount of stuff that if you're trying to do this at home, you may not have, but you can probably squish things. And so you can mechanically compress stuff as well. And so here is a friend of mine named Paul. And he made a model, and this is also release film on either side. And he just used a press to press his pieces together. So this is burlap and epoxy. And you just physically press them together. That also works perfectly fine. You can even get higher pressure with that because air pressure is capped at 15 PSI. This is, it looks like 11,000 pounds. Rather a lot. Or 100 and, 100 and... and I bet it looks really cool too. Because burlap is really cool. Yeah, it looked, I, I never saw the front front product actually. But I think it looked fine. I didn't see it in person. I saw a picture. Um, but yeah, that works great. This is if you want to do an open thing, it can be a good way to do it. But it's a lot of fun. If you're a real pro, and we're not making, I'm not a pro, I'll say, <laughs> you can do vacuum infusion. And this is how they make giant boats. Like, look at this crazy thing. Wow. Or car, car hoods, where they have release chambers and like, your A and B part of the resin, there's a mixed chamber, so they mix on their way in, and then you suck air out the sides. So I presume this is like a one-way valve kind of thing. Yeah. Well, the there there's vacuum pressure over here at three, so it's sucking it out in a way. It's like a really it's real. Yeah. 
It's, so again, vacuum is magical and it can do so many things. Really cool. Yeah. This thing that's going clear is going from that white fabric to when the epoxy's in there, it goes, it turns clear. That's what's going on down there. So it's really neat. Um, same deal here with the car hood. You can see sort of the, the simulation of it spreading out. And then here's the experiment of that happening. So it's a really interesting process. It's also probably well beyond what we're going to do. I'm going to just say here, yeah, because I know people are, you know, they're curious and they like to try things. When you are using a vacuum to actively pull material, if that material enters your vacuum pump, it is no longer a vacuum pump. It is a larger paperweight. So oh, keep that in mind. That's, that's actually true. And if we go back to ours here, our vacuum pump is down here and our entire system for vacuum bagging exits out of the bag. It goes in through the vacuum pot mm -hmm. and then it, and then it re-enters through the pump. The reason why we routed it that way is because if by some bad luck, resin starts to, kazunite starts to go up through this tube, it will exit and drop in this chamber. It will not make it to the pump. Those pumps are relatively expensive and it would become a paperweight. Yes. So it's a really good way for Make Haven to safeguard against people getting a pump. At worst, we would just have to replace the hose. Yeah, which is, which is perfect. Yeah. Yeah, because if you think about it, like, what if you pour, you know, something into a car engine that hardens? Mm -hmm. You know, it's not going to be an engine any longer. So that's the same principle. It's a little bitty engine. Yep. So, uh, and then vacuum infusion. And so if we're going to get started, there's a whole bunch of ways that we can get started. And these are basically what we're going to try and do this week is to make little fabric bowls. Um, there's a, there's a lot of ways that you could do this. If you wanted, you can play with concrete and rebar. I have, if we, if I can finagle through my computer the right way, and that's a real if, at some point I made concrete countertops for my kitchen back in Ohio. Uh, and that was fun. You can do concrete and rebar. You can make your own plywood if you're way into that, um, which is fun and interesting. Colorful micarta stock, that's just paper epoxied together, which is a really cool way to make you can make like hammers out of books if you wanted to. There's a good video of, of a YouTuber with the channel named Shop Time where he took uh, an Adam Savage book and turned it into a hammer, <laughs> which, is, which is just fun. Uh, and then fiberglass, carbon fiber, vacuum bagging. This is what we're going to do. And mechanical compression. These Making something like this this week is what we're going to try and make happen. Yes. And uh, vacuuming aside... A really, really like accessible and old school technique for like taking advantage of all of the great um, aspects of composites is just doing what is called a layup casting in a mold, which is not using, you know, vacuum. It's basically like the simplest version would be like plaster and burlap, where you can make a very strong hollow cast of something like I actually have a mold with me and I could drag that out if you guys want to see it um, yeah. where you can you, you paint the plaster into the mold and then as soon as it sets you dip some burlap in more plaster and lay it on the back side of the layer you just did you squish it in then you do more and this it's the sort of thing where you're manually pressing it into place but um Doing that allows you to do a really strong, very lightweight hollow casting. And they've been doing that for like hundreds, if not thousands of years. Like it's very simple uh, and super effective and very cheap to do. So if you're interested in just trying something, you know, you can take like literally any form and make yourself a little layup casting with just some rock fabric and plaster. And it's a composite. It's cool. Yeah. Doesn't require any equipment really other than a bucket. And a great way to fix a broken arm. Which is, which is true. Um, great. This is the end of our slides. Uh, specific questions. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, yeah. There's a lot coming at you. There's a, there's a million and one things to go along with this. Any, do we have any questions on the... No, no questions on the internet. Okay, all right. Questions there. Yeah. So would my card of stock just be paper and resin? Yeah, 100%. Let me, hold, hold on. I can find that video. Um... Just like layers, it's like imagine just soaking, soaking 
um, paper and resin and then laying it on top of it. So mm -hmm. layers. Yeah. It'll be, um, well, it's, it'll saturate okay. almost like any other liquid usually, um, unless it's probably got like a wax finish or something like, you know, it'll, cause. Oh, this is, I need to change that. <laughs> It's not going. It's, okay. I know, I know, I need that. Oh, one moment, one moment, please. The gag is not helpful if you're online. Uh, share screen, and we're going to share that one. And share. So here's the, this is the YouTube channel. But essentially what he's doing is just taking resin and covering every page of the book. Oh, that's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, he, if you watch this video, he talks about how it's essentially torturous. And it's really, it's not, it's, it's less fun than it looks like it is. But then you get this, which is just a brick of paper and resin. And for, no, that's an ad. Never mind. Sorry. Yeah, it's targeting us. It is. Feel that's the peeling that off. And so he's got an empty book and an epoxy soaked book. And he's just going to cut through it with a CNC machine. And did he compress it? I think he did, but it didn't fully like go to the same. Would, to do that, you would legit need a really slow, like a very, very long pot life. Yeah. Otherwise there's gonna be gaps in between the pages. Okay, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna go to here. Basically like this is, there's the book with the- I see that there's gaps, but it's it's so much resin. <laughs> um, yeah. But it, all of that, even though it's paper, like the paper is gonna be really good at keeping the resin from being it's just kind of a fun gag it is hilarious uh is going to be good at keeping the epoxy from shattering yep. and so you can use this like paper this paper and epoxy to make something that's really strong but what if you had like super colorful paper and you had a neat it could just be like layers of the color layers of the color paper exactly yeah. so it wouldn't have to be a book this is a technique that's used for making wood turning or turning blanks all the time. Yeah. People get bundles of, you know, colored pencils, still have them in resin. Oh, uh, yeah, and watch those videos. And then oh. if you can turn it on the lathe, you would be able to turn that mm -hmm. a, a piece of that book on the lathe. Um, my card of pens. Yeah. So, like, exactly what that is. Okay. Yeah. All right. This is just like layers of, well, you can. Yeah. This is maybe paper. It could you can do it with denim. There's a lot of cool things that you can do. It looks fun on the ends because that's like a little bit of a flat layer left over. So if you're way into turning pens, I can be... I mean, it's essentially a solid piece of plastic with extra sauce, kind of where it's mm -hmm. got another aspect that makes it even stronger. Um, yeah. They are bonkers strong. Oh, like it's very crazy. difficult to snap this stuff. Yeah. Oh, and look at how fun they can be. Yeah, it's uh, really so pretty. Cool. Yeah. So you would have to use uh, a resin that cures very slowly. Um. Well, think about how long it's going to take you to do the like paint and then with the dole of it still being liquid at the end so that you can compress it and make sure that everything is perfectly needed. Mm -hmm. So it's up to you how long that takes you. But I bet that guy spent a really long time doing that and it was getting quite tacky by the time. Yeah. Like I probably would have done it in sections, just you know, because yeah, I think I think that I mean you should go. I can't remember. It's been a while since I watched the video, but he definitely talks about how this sucks and I'm racing and it, <laughs> I gotta I, he's doing one page at a time at the start, and then he's doing five pages at a time and he's trying to get as much as he can in. Yeah. Because so. that and that I mean. <laughs> You have to sort of like plan out. I even write things down. Like, you know, there's a big rolls of paper that we have for covering um, the tables. I literally will take a Sharpie and write out my process step by step ahead of time. Sometimes, especially if it's a process I'm trying for the first time, I'll go through it. I'll map it out. And then I lay out everything in order and start. And then I still invariably, there's something I forgot that I have to scramble <laughs> in the middle of it. But you don't want to like, start your material because if the instant a material is mixed or it starts the clock is ticking it does not care if you forgot to put gloves on or you forgot to apply mold release to something or whatever it's gonna harden wherever it is at the moment that it finally kicks it's yeah. just and then that may be still in the bucket it could be on the floor where you dropped it because you were rushing it could be you know so i 
can attest to the fact that it just gets on stuff that's bonded bronze and then this is yeah silicone and that's plaster and don't wear clothes you like yeah that's a really good point um i guess two quick questions yes. um are all resins safe to use wood equipment with like you said you could turn stuff and then second are all resins safe to cure in the in the maker space um oh right you polyester resin no no okay okay it's from a like it's it, it off gases horrendously okay. and it will just make everyone evacuate the space it's not good um the one thing I would say as far as like there I would I would be hesitant to say that all of anything is safe because you it's really very much a case by case basis the issue with uh turning grinding you know anything like that is more the inhalation risk of dust and um, that also goes with mixing plaster and things like that you don't want to be inhaling that stuff because like, there are materials once they're in your body they're not going to leave so um you know it's a good point wear dust protection in situations like that because you are literally inhaling plastic dust because that's what it is they are plastics but the machinability of a resin and a wood are really close very similar so, so i'm not gonna like ruin uh, yeah. Finance. Right. Exactly. No. Yeah. I mean, it it is. They are plastics, and it's um, you know, the hardest resin is still not going to compete with like a very hard wood. Yeah. You know. But so it does it pretty. It's pretty. It, close. It can be pretty intense, but everything has hardnesses that are known. So if you're not sure, you're gonna you can actually look at the material specs on whichever material you're using and it will literally tell you this is how hard it is and then it will have all the other properties and so if you need to find something out specifically you can because they are required by law to present that yeah. with the products so there's an msds uh, material safety data sheet for every single product it will tell you what you need to know all the first aid and then all the properties and that is a lot of times what you'll use to choose the one that you're going to use so that you know that it will do what you need it to yeah. So for vacuum blind, oh, did we? Oh, you have a question, man. No, it's okay. Uh, I just had a quick question. So you said epoxy is like a commonly used resin for these projects. Is there like any preparation steps that we could take that set to somehow slow down the hardening of the resin? Um, the the short answer is pick the resin that has the inherent properties you want. There are additives, um, but it's usually it's usually more complicated to also get this extra component and add it in um, unless you're you're um, stocking like a basic resin and then you want to be able to like fine tune it for lots of things. But mostly I would say go for the one that makes sense for your projects and don't worry too much about that stuff. There are things, but they will usually change the property of the material when you add anything that either thickens, thins, speeds or slows the curing. It will also then have an ancillary effect where it will make the material softer, more bendable, harder, more brittle. You know, there will be some other change that goes along with that, which means it's not going to be as reliable. And since you're mixing it yourself, these things are frequently really contingent on you know, the percentages and the different um, amounts that go into it, which means if you if you tip your hand a little bit more and you add a little extra, it can have like a kind of outsized effect on the end result. So. I'm pulling up smooth on because they're the the preeminent retailer mm -hmm. that we would probably use. Um, and they have on the last page, I suppose, it was they have different product numbers. And so like for epoxamite, you have a 103 slow hardener and a 101 fast hardener, and there's a 102 medium hardener. Yep. So there's, it's two components and they control the chemical reaction rate based on the part B that you're adding in. Yep. And so you can, you can choose that, but that's different than like an additive. You often need to choose a different combination of resins. No, for the record, we do have some additives downstairs at the casting station that you guys can use. Um, always test first before you use, you know, it's like, don't try a new recipe on guests. <laughs> you want to you try it at a time, you know, 
subject to your partner for doing first for you based on the in-laws. And then um <laughs> because then you know you can kind of like work it out ahead of time and you don't risk ruining your projects. Um, the the epoxy use, specifically this epoxamite, and well, I mean a lot of these, though like there's the resin and then there's the hardener or the catalyst. And with a lot of them, the resin is the same regardless. It'll be just the epoxamide one of like, you know, 100 or whatever it is in a big yellow jug. And then the blue jug is the one that affects how quickly it cures or some other factor. And so you can have like one jug of the resin and then a couple of different hardeners, depending on what you need it to do, which is really handy. That's a nice feature of epoxy. And, and just like, look at how many products they have. Yeah. Right. Like there's, this is epoxy, epoxamite. Just listing those. Here's all yeah. different kinds see, of products. See the cure time. So your pot life at the top, you get 11 minutes to work with it. So you better be done. Yeah, and, but you can, un, you can uh, open it up in eight hours, but down at the bottom, you know, you've got over an, a, like an hour or so to work. And then you got to wait for 24 hours for it to, uh, to cure enough for you to open up your mold. Yep. And there is another factor that is something I would suggest you guys kind of just consider if you're if you're getting your own materials, and that is how difficult are they to mix. Many things are either like <laughs> I went, it's either it's formulated to be super user friendly, but it may have sort of like limited properties, or it's not particularly easy as in you need a, a very accurate gram scale. You, it's like a 10 to one ratio of hardener to, or of um, resin to hardener, but then you can really fine tune the results you get and it's really reliable or it's stronger or something like that. That's gonna be the case for the resins and for rubbers when we start doing molds. So um, look at that, does it require a gram scale to mix? Because then you're gonna to have to be doing some math during the process, right? Mm -hmm. If that doesn't appeal to you, there are some that are just like one-to-one. -one. You fill two cups, the same level. You don't even have to be that precise. You put them together and you're good to go. So yeah, there's a, a lot of these that you might bump into with Amazon sort of purchases. They're going to be that simple, like one-to-one -one mix by volume, not by mass. And then you go that way. Yeah. So when, or it's by weight. Yeah. Or yeah. yeah when you're going when you're buying from smooth on or some other like supplier who's expecting you to be sort of a business and know what you're doing with it, you may get those exotic 98 to one ratios of material. Got it dialed down pretty well, but yeah, you got to check. You got to check. Um, one, one thing I will say, um, I'm sure they will be displeased with me saying this, but if you have a question, you call the manufacturer, they have helplines, you say, this is what I'm trying to do, which one should I use? They know me. Oh, yes. <laughs> they know me and every other professional sculptor that I know, we call them all the time. So yeah. they're but, like, oh, you again. Sometimes they're on a first name basis. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's they're, they're there to help you and you should take advantage of that. Never feel bad calling that line. And it could be literally whatever weird, like I guarantee you it is not the weirdest thing they've heard, whatever you're doing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great. What's up? So that question about vacuum forming. Yes. Mm -hmm. So is there, I noticed that we tended to like go for some very hollow or like bowl-like shapes. I noticed, is there any shapes that is a no? Like anything that's going to have negative draft angles. What, what are those? What that means is it creates a mechanical lock. It's going to grab also, and... We're going to talk about this more when yeah. we get to molding and casting, but this is a good preview of what that'll be. Yeah. But, yeah. So um, the, when you're making something, and we'll, we'll get into this later, molding and casting, the, the mold is the form that you're using to create a shape, which is the cast. Like that is, so those two things go together. Um, when the reason that we have these bowls and things is because this will just, even if, if the bowl and the mold are completely rigid, you tip them upside down, they're going to pop themselves apart because there's nothing to mechanically grab them. If this had like a lip that came under and, and the reason that these are so nicely, we still have those, oh, so it's, it's we, we, uh, 
And we, by we, I mean me. I forgot to um, not allow the the fabric to go over the lip of the bowls when we're doing that, which means Corey had to mangle them open <laughs> and cut the bowl itself to get it out because it, it literally just wrapped around and locked in. So if you have something, if your if your mold does not come apart to allow you to get it out, it'll just grab on and not let go. Like imagine like a cast on your arm, you know, like if it came in two parts, it'll open like a clamshell. You'll be able to get your arm out. But if it goes too far around, then it's grabbing. You know? So like this one, it it extended outward. And so when I was doing it, I was really careful because this was probably the next day. Or we're just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I tried really hard to make sure that it went out and away. And the bowl was like flat on the ground and there was no way that it could get under. Um, and then you can just cut this off later. It's not a big deal. But if it was wrapped around, then it then it's in there for forever. We had or for until you until you mangle some part of it. Is this why like when people are doing like because I've seen a few times that somebody's done like a mold of their hands and they just can't, it ends up breaking because they had their, because they had their fingers like bent. At the... Usually that'll mean they were using the wrong material. Oh, okay. Um, because either the thing you're casting or the molds have to be at least a little flexible to, unless you have a perfect parting, like that clamshell idea where it just comes apart and um, there's nothing to hold it in place. Like if it can't just fall out on its own, something needs to be able to give a little bit. Um, so I don't know if any of you guys do ceramics, but ceramic slip casting is an interesting example where typically the mold will be squishy and you're casting something that's rigid. Ceramics, it's inverted because the molds are made of plaster and then you're taking wet clay out of it. And so that has enough give, but they still have to be engineered so they mostly come apart you know it's it's an interesting process but you gotta um kind of bow to the laws of physics after a certain point <laughs> so good news is it's a guided tour this week yeah, for sure um yeah and so i i realized we did not talk it through tuesday and sunday just in my brain were the times that we would do this sunday for sure sunday tuesday for sure. Evening, sure yeah tuesday evening is the only time i was going to be here uh so we'll do this process and you can come play along bring your own favorite fabric if you want um well or there's a lot of fabric or there's, in the, yeah yeah the area there's there's, you, there's a ton of that yeah. the reason we use these is because they are readily available they were already made by a process that required them to be the right shape um and they are cheap and if we do for some reason they were 50 cents on the floor yes nice. yeah but if you have something similar I'm gonna buy it. Maybe we could use it. So, are you saying we could also use those bowls that um? I'm sorry. So, like, let's say we use those bowls for the vacuum form. Mm -hmm. Oh, the other ones. Mm -hmm. That also. Be oh, these deeper cheap? ones. Yeah. Yes. yes. No, no, no. I mean the ones that you. Oh like, no, no, no. Woven, the ones. The ones the, yeah, the ones that we passed around. Those are the product of using. The product. Will we'll be able to use that type of thing? He, yeah. As like basically as the like well okay so I mean maybe they have sort of a nubbly texture on one saying. side of them. Uh, texture is gonna make it hard. I, I you could theoretically do it this way, but they are they're not overly rigid, right. so there's gonna be some weirdo like effect that just happens, and it's gonna be like a taco when it comes out, mm -hmm. just because. That's what always happens. There's some strange effects that you don't anticipate. Um, but you know, so the, these were kind of our last attempts. Yeah. To actually, make the thing. So the molds are nicer when they're rigid. These are so they just work so stupidly well for fifty cents that we're just going to use them. Say, like what, injection molds. What is it made out of in your hand? Um, this it, this these are both using epoxy resin. It's the epoxy No, I know, but the it the, is Kevlar and um, carbon, carbon fiber. fiber, which is the same stuff. This stuff here, which we have. Gotcha. Downstairs. Uh, we I think we have Eight. some of both. Don't and don't try it, but seven seven layers of Kevlar seven. will stop a bullet. Yeah, certain bullets. Certain bullets. Certain oh. below a certain. And don't and don't don't try. Don't try. Yeah. Don't make parachutes. Don't, <laughs> don't make body armor. 
There's a, there's a lot of things um, to advise against. Yeah. Sorry, Lord, as I feel like I just squashed your dream. Yeah. <laughs> I just know, like, once you have the Templar, I was like, oh, body armor. Yeah. 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 Or like motorcycles, so, you know, like yep. whatever needs to, you know, absolutely get your, your fresh out of little squishy flakes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other other thoughts or ideas before we get to show and tell? Any other questions? There's a lot of things. It's going to be fun. So in, we're going to say it again later and repeatedly, but Tuesday evening and Sunday afternoon-ish. Come in. We'll just do this. It'll be there'll be a practice run, and then we'll do it for real, and it'll be a great time. Yeah, and, and we'll do like a, a an official announcement of starting time. I guess once we figure that out. Yeah. Oh, also, also worth mentioning. Next week will be is May twenty fifth for class, and that will be a be here in person sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So for all of you who are at home, it'll be a and we'll. We'll totally announce it, but it's a good be here in person because we're going to do a PCR test on your own DNA and look at your own genetics. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's fun. Don't question it. It's going to be weird and great. Wait. Yeah, we're going to use the bio room next week. Oh, okay. Like, how is this related to sweat and squishy? It's sweat. Okay. It's, it's wet. There's a liquid involved. Yeah, okay, fair enough. We are the liquid. Yeah. Oh, I hate that so much. <laughs>